Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. Who has not marveled at the quiet beauty of a butterfly when they grace our gardens with their presence? But these lovely creatures are more than just another set of pretty wings. We are going to learn more about their importance from today's guest. Marjorie Heyman is Executive Director of the Elkton Community Education Center, to which she brings a background in community development. Prior to joining the Education Center, she helped start a farm internship program in Lane County and served as the director of the McKenzie River Gathering Foundation. Marjorie, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much. It's for great being to be here. here. <laughs> so, tell us more about uh, the Elkton uh, Community Education Center and your work there. Great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come and talk with folks throughout Lane County about what we're doing in Elkton. So Elkton is a town of about 200 people in northern Douglas County. And it is you know, within an hour's drive of Eugene, but I'm surprised at how few people in Eugene know that we're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, now is your opportunity exactly. to <laughs> spread the word. Exactly. It is a beautiful, beautiful location. We're right on the banks of the Umpqua River. So I actually brought a few photos of the center itself and thought maybe we could just start with me describing what we do there and what we have and the many, many things people Sounds can enjoy good. if they come visit. Yeah, let's see those, those photos. Great, yeah. So we're on Highway 38, which is one of the scenic byways in Oregon. And the way folks get there from here is you go down I-5, take the drain exit to Highway 38 on your way to Reedsport. We're about halfway between I-5 and the coast. And you'll be looking for this sign just after you pass the town of Elkton. You can keep going now. Um, we are a community education center, and so we really have two main purposes. We are a, a gathering place for people in northern Douglas County and guests, and we also do a lot to attract tourists and give folks a place to enjoy. We are a gardening and butterfly oasis. Next, please. We're best known for our butterfly growing program, and uh, we raise both monarchs and painted ladies. We're going to talk a lot more about them just a little bit later. We also have a four and a half acre native plant park and the park is organized into eight different ecosystems of Oregon. Uh, we're really fortunate in Elkton to be in an area where we can successfully grow about 80% of the native plants that are grown throughout Oregon. So it's a great place for a demonstration garden. Mm. Yeah. Oops. And yeah, there's it's art beautiful. scattered throughout the site as well. We actually, all together, we have 30 acres of land. Um, and like I said, it's right on the banks of the Umpqua River. So just a beautiful, beautiful location. A surprise for a lot of folks that visit us is that we also have a replica of historic Fort Umpqua, which was the southernmost trading fort of the Hudson's Bay Company in the mid 1800s. Um, so people who come for the butterflies then uh, get to travel back in time to that period as well. So by replica, you mean that it has been reconstructed in the way that they believe it used to be? That's right. Yeah. The original fort was about a mile upriver from our site. Mm -hmm. And while there aren't any specific plans that have um, been preserved from that time, there are... Um, journals and other written materials that talk about what the fort was like and so we did our best to replicate that with a lot of donated lumber and volunteer labor. And in front of the fort there you can see some of our gardens. So we have extensive gardens, both vegetable gardens as well as the the butterfly gardens. I'm guessing you get a lot of school field trips here. We do. We have yeah. about 20 field trips a year, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So there's another shot of the garden. We can uh, go one more. Of the, well, one of the things we do with the gardens is we raise produce there. And the town of Elkton doesn't have a grocery store. So we have become one of the most important suppliers of fresh uh, oh, fruit and vegetables. Stand. We have a farm stand, <laughs> yes. Yet another reason to stop. <laughs> one stop shopping yeah. at the community <laughs> education that's center. That's right, that's right. And last year we raised 20,000 pounds of vegetables. Is that right? <laughs> it's true. Wow, that's yes. quite, that's something to be proud of. Yeah, yeah, that's we great. are. And we donate close to 25% of what we grow to local food banks. So mm -hmm. in addition to being a source of fruits and vegetables for folks that want to stop at the produce stand, we're also providing fresh, healthy food to families throughout the area. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. 
So there might be a couple more photos on there about the, the center itself. So another thing that I think your viewers might be really interested in is that we also operate a native plant nursery. So people who come to visit can get a lot of information about native plants that are very successful in backyard habitats in our area, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then buy the plants that they want for their I would own be very backyard habitat. In that. Great. <coughs> we are, of course, a community center. This is our community building. And um, the next slide you'll see that our community center also operates as the local library. So we're not officially you part really of the- You really are one-stop <laughs> shopping. It's really true. We're not officially part of the Douglas County Library System. We don't receive any of the, the county funding, but we have a great agreement with them so that uh, folks can do interlibrary loan <coughs> and pick up their, their books from our site. And here's a map. So anyone who is in the Eugene or Creswell or Cottage Grove area that's never been to Elkton, you now have no excuse. It's very clear and easy how to get there. Again, you just head down I-5, take the drain exit out towards Reedsport, and we're about halfway between uh, I-5 and the coast. I'm pretty sure I have driven past there on the way to the coast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's the perfect place to stop. It's right at that place where you want to get out and stretch your legs. Mm -hmm. And so we are there with gardens and bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and native plants. And yes, yes. And Many yes. families have found Library, us <laughs> because of the bathrooms. <laughs> fruits and veggies to buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like a wonderful place. So um, you have some information on the founder. Mm -hmm. uh, and the town. Yeah, well, you know, it's such an interesting story to me. I, I've been there for just about a year, so I feel like I still get to bring that, um, you know, the new person's perspective and mm -hmm. talk about how amazing it is without it sounding terribly self-serving <laughs> <laughs> because so much was done before I got there. Um, ECEC, which is how most people know us, has been around for 15 years now. And our founder was Carol Beckley. There's her photo. And she is a retired teacher who is passionate about the town of Elkton, where she has lived for many decades. Uh, the next slide is a, a shot of the town. And I love this photo because I think for a lot of us, we sort of romanticize small towns, but we all know that many small towns in Oregon and really throughout the country are struggling. And, and Elkton is one that has stayed very vibrant and largely because of the level of community engagement there. With a population of 200, our community center has about 60 volunteers a year. <laughs> now, of course, we're drawing from beyond just the town of Elkton, but it does give you a, a sense of how engaged people are. There yeah, are that's, also that's a very respectable number yeah, it of is, volunteers. Yeah, it is. There are five wineries in Elkton and three restaurants, and you know, there's camping nearby, which is a lot of reasons to come. Um, so that slide that was just on this screen is really, uh, so this is our butterfly pavilion here. And one of the things that our founder realized was that she, she wanted to have a place where people of all ages could come and do things together. And she wanted to create a place that would really draw folks to the community of Elkton. Mm -hmm. And she realized early on that people are drawn to gardens and they're drawn to butterflies. And so the original impetus for the Butterfly Pavilion was to help attract more people uh, to come to the town. Well, there's definitely a lot of literature out there for people who want to create butterfly gardens mm -hmm. and or provide habitat for them or you know food or, or whatever. So yeah, you're right. The, that that is a great way to draw people to your town. And I think it's a growing interest too. I think as more people become aware of how the monarch population is struggling, there is a real renewed interest in, in figuring out how to create more habitat for them. And so we're really pleased to be a site where people can come and get more information and get the plants from the native plant nursery and, and build their own backyard habitats. I, I know that you're going to talk about mm -hmm. that later, so I will save my questions <laughs> about that for later. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything else that we need to know about the founder or the town, or can we, can we talk about how you raise butterflies? Well, I guess the last thing that I would add about what we're doing at the center, and, and if we could put those next couple of photos up, is that at the heart of everything we do is our youth employment mm -hmm. program. And each summer we hire about 15 students from the local high school and they come and give tours. This is uh, one of our students giving a tour in the Butterfly Pavilion. And uh, at the next slide, you can also see that the students, a lot of them are getting very specialized training in um, local history. 
And so we've got students that get trained to do historical reenactments from the mid 1840s. And so they're in costume and they each have their own identity and it's that a lot fantastic. of fun. <laughs> yeah. So it's like an internship in historical reenactment. Exactly. And so if you think again about like a small town and what it takes to help it stay vibrant, one of the things that's really difficult is employment and ways mm -hmm. of really making keeping, it possible. Keeping the younger population there. Exactly. Exactly. So we're helping that with our own youth employment program, but we're also helping the kids that graduate from Elkton High School go on to get future employment because they have training in public speaking and customer service. They operate a cafe mm -hmm. at our site during the summer. You know, they do what presentations. What a great program. Yeah, it's, it's a great place to be. Oh, I, I, you must just be so full of joy to mm -hmm. go to work every it's day. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. There was a point last summer where I was calling a friend saying, who would have known, you know, two years ago that I would be spending my summer watching butterflies emerge from chrysalis, you know? <laughs> it's like, this is amazing. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> what else? T tell us more. Yeah, well, let's talk more about the butterflies. Okay. So, um, you know, I said a little bit about how the monarch population is struggling, and I, I do think that's a story that more and more people are aware of. But I just wanted to add a, a few bits of information a around that. Um, you know, some people estimate that the monarch butterfly population has dropped by 90% in the last 20 years. 90? I mean, that's the scale that, it, it surprised me oh. when I read that. <laughs> it's it's wow, a huge, shocking. huge drop, yeah. And the main reason why the monarchs are, um, are struggling is because of a loss of habitat. Mm -hmm. And so the, all the butterflies can enjoy nectar from a wide variety of plants, but each type of butterfly needs a specific host plant for its young to survive. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna, I've got some slides about that a little bit later. <laughs> But I bring it up now because when we talk about loss of habitat, what we're talking about with the monarchs is the loss of milkweed, yeah. which is a very specific plant. And so as we have you know, taken out prairie land and put in more fields, milkweed is getting taken out. As we increase the use of pesticides, and this is a place where you know, having GMO crops that are resistant to pesticides means that more pesticides can be used. Yes. So we're seeing that the use of pesticides go up. Climate change is having an effect because butterflies are very temperature sensitive. You know, the changes in temperature tell them when to start heading south, when to mate, you know, all these things that are Little critical to their life survival. Cycle cues. Right. From minute changes in temperature. Exactly. So if you get extremes and hot and cold in places where they didn't used to be, mm -hmm. then it really throws their cycle off as well. So you've got a bunch of confused butterflies uh, fluttering about not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. that, it makes it much harder for them to thrive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of what we're doing is raising more butterflies. And, you know, to a large degree, our site is really about education. You know, no one butterfly pavilion is going to have a significant effect on the numbers of butterflies out in the wild. But by having the pavilion where people can come and learn about the life cycle, learn about how to create their own habitat, we have the potential to increase the milkweed that's out in the communities around us. And then when the monarchs come through, there are more and more places that they can stop and, mm -hmm. and lay their eggs. Uh, in Oregon, where we are, we are on the flyway. There are two butterfly monarch flyways um, in the United States. So all of the butterflies to the east of the Rockies head down to Mexico every winter, and the monarchs on the west side of the United States head down to Southern California. So we're on that flyway. Um, we do see monarchs in the wild where we are, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and then people can come to the pavilion to see many more of them in one place. <laughs> So it sounds like it is possible for uh, you to have, I'll call them branches, of the butterfly raising program out on private property here and there if people are interested. Absolutely. Yeah? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we really encourage that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're planning to talk about that specifically, but I would like to hear more about it. If, okay. uh, you know, at some point, you know, while we're, we're talking about this, Great. You know, how that could be accomplished. Great. Yeah. Well, let's talk more about butterflies in general, and then we'll talk about butterfly gardens and, okay. and how to create more. Okay. So um, butterflies are incredibly photogenic, and we've got a picture here of the monarch, and it is just beautiful and majestic. 
I think for a lot of us, we, when we think butterfly, this is the image that comes into our mind. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, many, many different types of butterflies. Um, at our pavilion, we raise monarchs and painted ladies, which we'll see in the next slide. I mentioned earlier how butterflies can enjoy a wide range of nectar plants, but each type of butterfly has one or two host plants that it needs for its young to, to survive. So this is a painted lady butterfly, and it's resting on a mallow plant. That's the host for the painted lady. Is that the only host for the painted lady? No, well, there are many types of mallows. So to start with, you've got options there, and the thistle is also a host plant. Hmm. You know, it seems like not a lot of people are wanting to plant thistle in their yards. I was just thinking about all the thistles that I tried to eradicate yeah. from my property last summer, and I'm now feeling very guilty about that. So we do tend to promote the mallow, and we don't sell thistle plants <laughs> in our nursery. Yeah, I would be more, more up for the mallow. It's a lovely flower, yeah. And as you'll see on the next slide, um, so this is the milkweed. So the host plant for the monarch is the milkweed. There are over a hundred different types of milkweed plants as well. So again, a lot of variety. Some of them are native in our area. Some of them are uh, native to other areas but can be grown here. Does your native uh, nursery sell these? Yes. Oh, that's great news. Yes, yeah. So we have uh, three kinds of, um, of milkweed that we grow and sell at the nursery. We also have seeds. And so what this slide shows is the, um, the caterpillars thriving on the milkweed. Now, they, um, this is their food source. This is the caterpillar's only food source, is their host plant. Mm -hmm. And so they will uh, quickly make their way through the plant that they're on right now in this picture. <laughs> okay. And the next picture? Yeah. And, you know, how we mentioned earlier the butterflies can enjoy a wide range of nectar plants. So here you see the mallow, which is the host plant for the painted lady, being enjoyed by a monarch for its nectar. Mm -hmm. And I like this photo also because it gives me an opportunity to show people how you can tell the difference between a male and a female monarch butterfly. And the telltale sign is that the male butterfly, which is what we're looking at right now, if you notice where the body is right in the center between yes. the two wings, yes. the thick line on either side of the body has what looks like a dot in the middle of the line. Do you see where, I'm, where I mean? So near the bottom of the butterfly, the line on the wing just to the left and right of the body yes. has sort of a thicker node in it. And that spot is, the, is an indication that you're looking at a male monarch. I think I see it a, at least on one side, but I'm not wearing uh, my distance glasses, uh, <laughs> so that's probably the problem. Okay. I'll well, take your word for it. Hopefully folks that are looking at, it, at, at their TV screen <laughs> can see those two nodes down there I'm at the sure bottom. everybody else can see it just fine. <laughs> right. Great, great. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, look at this next slide. So this is the monarch caterpillar. So the caterpillars also look different from one another. This is the monarch. And I included this slide because you, you get a sense of the number of caterpillars that we start growing in our pavilion. So the, the, adult, mon, uh, the adult butterfly lives for about a month, a little bit more than a month. And so over the course of the summer, we have three generations of butterflies in our pavilion. So when that first generation starts laying eggs and the caterpillars come out, we've got a lot more butterflies. And then those butterflies lay eggs. And then we've got a lot more caterpillars. And so there comes a point in the summer where we literally are seeing caterpillars like this on the plants. And their main job is to eat. And so they will eat and eat and eat. So what we find that we're doing is we're, we're literally like picking up caterpillars by the hands full and taking them into our research room. And then each caterpillar gets put into an individual cup with a milkweed leaf. And twice a day, every single day, we have to go through, we open up each cup, take out the caterpillar, shake out the caterpillar poo, <laughs> put the caterpillar <laughs> back in, put more milkweed in, and start the cycle all over again. <laughs> the caterpillar wranglers. Yes, yes. So that is one of the many lovely jobs that the high school students get to do. And, you know, they really enjoy it. I bet they do. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like something a high school student would enjoy. How many of us get to feed caterpillars every and day, And dump right? out their poo. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
And the caterpillars don't fight with each other. They're, they're not competitive or territorial? Well, in that situation, once we've taken them out, one of the reasons why we take them out of the, the butterfly pavilion at that stage is because there are so many caterpillars for this space. So that would create stress between the caterpillars. Okay. When we take them out, they each get their own individual cup, and so they get to just... You know, Life is good. Exactly. <laughs> Eat away and <laughs> wait for the next meal to show up. <laughs> so, um, so similar to having a lot of caterpillars, we end up with a lot of butterflies as well. We, we estimate that at the peak of the summer, which for us is going to be kind of early August, we could easily have 400 butterflies in our pavilion. Wow. And this is a pavilion that, you know, we're talking about like 20 by 50 feet, so it's not a, a large space. So, because we have that many, we supplement their food. So we bring in flowers from outside the pavilion and other things that they have a constant source of nectar. I have been in the butterfly sanctuary in Mexico, mm. the, where the monarchs congregate mm -hmm. in the winter. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, of course, millions. Uh, mm -hmm. And I still remember what, what an awesome experience that was to be surrounded by all these fluttering creatures mm -hmm. it was like being in an orange snowstorm it's it, spectacular it, it must be something like that in your little pavilion with the 400 uh, you know all there at once mm -hmm. it, it's just mm -hmm. an amazing experience <laughs> yeah and the more caterpillars we have the more likely they are to land on people which is always a lot of fun oh yes <laughs> <laughs> there's some great photo opportunities mm -hmm. there yeah so I think there's uh, one other slide in this section and the reason I included this is that this is a photo of a plant called Joe pie weed and it's not a plant that a lot of folks know about, but it is very, very popular with the butterflies. So it's a nectar source, not one of the host plants, but um, for people who maybe already have a garden and are looking for ways to mix it up or make it even more butterfly friendly, um, they really enjoy the Joe Pye weed. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, I have considered growing Joe Pye weed. I didn't know that it was especially favored by butterflies, but mm -hmm. now that I know that, I I'll definitely look for, for some to put in mm -hmm. my garden. Great. <laughs> so, um, so the next thing I thought we might talk about is the life cycle yeah. of the butterflies. That yeah. sound like something people would be interested I'm in. I'm sure they will. <laughs> great, great. Again, we'll go back to the photos. Uh, so this is, again, a monarch caterpillar. And one of the things that people um, who are sitting closer to their screens can see is that there's the large caterpillar that's really easy to make out. But if you look closely lower down on the, uh, just, just below it down on the plant, is a much smaller caterpillar. Oh, Chance. yes. Yeah? Yeah, even I can see that. Great, <laughs> great. So when the caterpillar emerges from its egg, uh, it's like the size of an eyelash. And I said earlier that the caterpillar's job is to eat. And the reason for that is that it needs to get from being the size of an eyelash to being the size of the caterpillar that we see on our screen. So it's That's a lot of leaves. It's a it lot consumed. of leaves. <laughs> it's true. In fact, that plant that this is sitting on probably was very leafy <laughs> just a couple of days before <laughs> this photo was taken. So this picture is of a painted lady caterpillar. Now this is very, very young. It probably just emerged from the, the egg um, because of the photo itself, I can tell, is enlarged. Um, and I brought it along just to show the difference in the caterpillars between the painted ladies and the monarchs. You know, the monarchs are brilliantly striped and very eye-catching, and the painted lady is really colored more to kind of blend in with, you know, wood or bark or mm -hmm. an old leaf. And so, for me, it's, it's interesting to see how much they can vary yeah. at their different stages. So the caterpillars are going to eat for about a, a week and a half. And when they get ready to form their chrysalis, they're going to find a surface that they can attach to and hang in this J shape. Uh, while they're caterpillars, they, um, they molt. They actually they shed their skin five times. That's part of them growing larger. And once they've gone into this J shape, that's going to happen about, like it's like about 10 to 12 hours. So they don't stay here very long. Um, and what they do at the end of that time is they molt that last time and when that final skin comes off it's basically revealing the chrysalis that's inside. And the chrysalis is? The chrysalis is where it will go through its metamorphosis to becoming a butterfly. So, 
So this is the caterpillar right before the chrysalis, and now we're looking at the chrysalis themselves. So it, this is a little bit of a funny picture because it's not a chrysalis hanging off of a leaf, which is what you would typically find you know, out in, in the wild. But these are cut from caterpillars that we had taken into the research room, and you know how I mentioned that each one was in its own cup. Yes. On top of the cup is a coffee filter. And so when they get ready to form their chrysalis, they hang from the coffee filter at the top of the cup oh. in the J. Once the chrysalis is revealed, we cut that part of the coffee filter off, bring the chrysalis back into the pavilion, and hang it up on a board so that when the butterflies come out, they come out in the pavilion. <laughs> so they are literally <laughs> posted on a bulletin board. They are literally posted on a bulletin board, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, hey, whatever works. <laughs> well, you know, one of the beautiful things about that is that there will then come a point where, you know, we might have like 15 or 20 butterflies, chrysalis, excuse me, that are ready. You know, the mm -hmm. butterflies are ready to emerge. And that is a great time. Like if you visit on one of those days, it is fabulous because your chances of watching one emerge are, are pretty high. And is there a particular time of year, a particular month? When, when does that typically happen? Yeah, so it... it you know, by the time we get to the middle of the summer, it's pretty constant. So that um, the way that we operate is our butterfly pavilion is not climate controlled. So it is the it is the climate of the area that we're in, mm -hmm. and it's basically a hoop house, and it's covered with 40% shade cloth. And we work with some folks that do have a climate controlled center and we bring in the chrysalis at the beginning of the year. So our first generation of butterflies come as chrysalis and they emerge in our pavilion, and then they lay eggs and have, we ha like I said, we have about three generations of butterflies over the course of the summer. So that first month or so, you wouldn't see chrysalis because the butterflies haven't mated and laid their eggs yet. But by the time we get into July and August, it's pretty, it's pretty constant. So you have a, a very, certainly a good chance of seeing all the stages of the butterfly. So July and August is a good time to visit if you yes. want to watch the butterfly emerge from the chrysalis. That's right. Okay, I will make a mental note of that. That's right. And so for folks that, that can't make it down, or at least aren't making it down at the time they're watching this, um, I did bring a video so that we get oh, to watch one emerge fabulous. right now. Let's <laughs> see that. Great. And I will fully admit this is not the best visual quality, but what you want to watch for is on the screen, you see some butterflies that are kind of hanging there, and then kind of in the center of the screen, sort of halfway down, you can see a, a dark um, spot that's getting larger. So there is a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. The one that's moving? Yes. So there's a butterfly kind of in the center of the screen that's hanging, and just above it, the, the one that's moving, that is a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. Oh, I see it. Can you see that? Yeah. And there are a few things that I find fascinating about this. So, you know, before I started working here, I imagined that when the, it came out, that its wings were like all folded up, or that it was just small and it was going to grow bigger over time. But what's really happening here is that the wings themselves are quite small, but the abdomen is quite large. So folks that are looking at it on a television screen can probably make out the abdomen. I can see it. Uh, from here as well, but on that butterfly, the abdomen is very thick and elongated, and the wings are very small. What's actually happening here is that the butterfly has a fluid in its abdomen that it is now going to start pumping out of the abdomen and into the wings. Fascinating. So it's not that the butterfly, you know, starts as a small creature and grows into a larger creature over time. It's that everything it needs is there, but the wings have to be sort of... Uh, pumped up, for lack of a better, <laughs> for more scientific <laughs> terminology. Butterfly workout. Exactly, exactly. And so the butterfly's abdomen is going to get smaller and smaller, and that's probably good for the video. I think the camera starts to wander at that point. The abdomen gets smaller and smaller, the wings get larger, and they're quite wet at that stage. So when you're, you're standing there with them, you can tell it's they're not literally dripping, like there's not a liquid drop coming off, but you can tell they're just they look down wet and, and they're yeah. sort of hanging off the back of the butterfly. And so that butterfly that's newly emerged is going to stay there where it emerged for several hours to give its wings a chance to dry off and it needs to do that so that it can fly. Now what would happen if something touched the, the wet wings? Mm -hmm. You know, the practice is um, don't touch the butterflies. Um, 
I don't know that a single touch, you know, would do damage in, in the sense that the butterfly wouldn't thrive. But as much as possible, you know, we just really want to let the butterfly kind of go through its process and, mm -hmm. and let the wings dry so that it can, can fly on its own. But as you can imagine, it's a very vulnerable time. I was just about to say uh, a butterfly that is out in, you know, the wild somewhere would probably be very vulnerable to predators mm -hmm. at that point. Right, right. I have seen some estimates that say that as few as 5% of butterflies in the wild um, survive. So if you go from egg to adult, that it's like 5% of them make it all the way there. I, in our pavilion, it's closer to 90% because it's a protected environment, there's a food source, and if they start running out of food, there's a whole crew of people mm -hmm. <laughs> that are out there cutting flowers and bringing them in so that the, the butterflies continue to thrive. So that suggests that in the days before the, the overall loss of butterfly population, that they were uh, producing lots and lots of little caterpillars who um, managed to put themselves into a chrysalis. Mm -hmm. if, if only 5% survive that stage of the life cycle, then they must have been reproducing in huge numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, wow. That's... that's um, it's kind of mind-boggling to think about. Yes, yes. There are a lot of butterflies out there. You know, and it, it takes a very large population for the population to continue to thrive because, because of the loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. So more and more reasons for people to, um, to step in and help uh, by pro providing the proper habitat. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, are, you, are you ready now to tell us how we can create our own butterfly garden? Absolutely. Okay, go for it. So, the short version is plant milkweed. <laughs> the slightly longer version is <laughs> that there are actually a lot of things we can do to Im improve the habitat. Um, because butterflies enjoy a wide variety of nectar plants, and you can see in the picture here, you can have a beautiful flower garden and butterflies are going to be really happy to find it. This is the garden at ECEC. Uh, so folks um, are certainly welcome to come and enjoy our gardens and ask questions about the plants that we're planting. And, and in our nursery, we have native plants, but we also have uh, flowering perennials and um, butterfly-friendly plants. So that, that's really what we focus on. So here we've got a list of some of the nectar plants that we grow and sell at ECEC. And for the gardeners you know, in the, the viewing audience, there are going to be a lot of very familiar names and they're really popular plants that, that people enjoy. A couple of things I wanted to call attention to, again, the Joe Pye weed, and we saw a photo of that earlier, is definitely one to add to the list if it's not on your list already. It does grow quite tall, so you want to know that you're, um, that you're ready for that. I mean, certainly in some gardens, they're not going to want to add Joe Pye weed, but it's a, a tall and very thick and kind of bushy mm -hmm. plant. Um, so if you've got space for it, that's great. And then the plants here with the asterisk are fall blooming plants. So that's another important thing to keep in mind for providing nectar, is to have a variety of flowering plants that will flower throughout the season so that uh, food is available for more time. Some other things to keep in mind, and, and we can go on to a, another photo here. It's really just a, a picture of a beautiful garden. Um, it, another one of the ECEC gardens. So some other things to keep in mind when putting together a butterfly garden are that um, having a space that's in full sun is ideal. Having it protected from the wind when possible is really nice. Mm -hmm. That just you know, makes it easier, of course, for the butterflies. Um, they're not competing with the wind. And having some sort of water source is very helpful. Now that could be a fountain or it could be even just a, like a, a puddle with sand in the bottom, you know, like an indentation that retains water fairly well with sand. The butterflies will drink the water. They'll also often land on moist sand and can extract I've liquids and nutrients from that. I've seen, all my life, I've seen butterflies landing on mud even, mm -hmm. just, just wet patches of the mm -hmm. ground. Yeah. Yeah, they really enjoy a fine mist. So you know, for folks that are able to put in water features, you know, having having a fountain or something that releases a bit of a mist is really nice for the butterflies too. Um, can we go back to that list of of nectar sources again? I yes, mm -hmm. I was yeah. wondering if um, if you can point out anything that you know to be deer resistant. 
That is a great question, and I wish that I wish I were the kind of person that had that information <laughs> right at well, my fingertips. I know that lavender is because I've had really good luck with growing lavender that mm -hmm. my dear uh, leave alone. I'm not certain about any of the others. Possibly marigold. Um, yeah, I think marigold. They, they, they leave globe this alone. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So. So the things that are um, spikier, I agree with you, like the marigold um, is resistant to a, a lot of things. Apparently it gives off an aroma that, um, that many animals don't enjoy. But, you know, it's a really good question, and I, I think probably the best thing to do for someone who's planning their garden is just to do a quick search, you know, that plant and deer resistant and, and kind of get the mix. This is also a good opportunity for me to describe one of the projects we've done at ECEC, and that is that one year the students in the Youth Employment Program did a research project on native plants that are good for backyard habitats mm -hmm. and produced a book, and we now sell that book in our gift shop. And one of the things that I love about that book in particular is that you know there are so many resources out there around native plants and deer resistant plants and butterfly gardens, but because this one is so specific to our area and, um, and it also focuses on the plants that we grow in our nursery. So it's been a great resource for people who are ready to, to create that garden and they can like use the book as a resource and get the plants right there at the nursery. And yeah, that's great. Something. Yeah. And I've done the, the internet searching myself, but what I have found is that there are all kinds of opinions out there That's about true. what is deer resistant and what mm -hmm. is not. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it, it's almost as if you need to ask the deer themselves. You know, I, I have planted many things that claim to be deer resistant, and um, the deer ate them as if it was the most delicious thing I'd ever found. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably you just have to do a lot of experimenting, I'm guessing. Well, and as any gardener knows, if there aren't a lot of food sources out there for the deer, things that they typically wouldn't head for first become deer food, right? It's, yeah. it's all about... At the height of summer, I don't think the lack of food choices mm, are... True. At least not on my property. <laughs> true. <laughs> that, that's not uh, so much of an issue. Yeah. But I have definitely had some plants that I thought were deer resistant that kind of disappeared over the winter and not because of the weather. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you saw the bite marks on mm -hmm. what was left. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so discouraging. <laughs> Spend lots of time on your garden and then watch it be eaten in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah it's true. So um, what are some of the ways that individuals can get involved in creating their own backyard habitat? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the simplest thing is really just to think about your own garden and look for places where you can add more flowering plants, um, add some host plants. There are other butterflies in Oregon, and so getting familiar with the butterflies that you and your neighbors have seen in your area and finding out what the host plants are for those butterflies and, and planting them. Um, this is probably a good a time to mention a couple of organizations that are really good resources as well. Mm -hmm. There's one called Monarch Watch, and their website is monarchwatch.org. And they've really put their focus on the health of the monarch population, what people can do, what some of the conservation efforts are. And so it's just, um, it's got a wealth of information for folks that want to go deeper with that. Another group that's really useful is the North American Butterfly Association. And there is a chapter here in Eugene Springfield that's very easy to find on the web. And again, they've got a lot of um, really specific information about the butterfly count in this area and what changes and trends people have been seeing over time. There are some larger conservation efforts that are going on. So creating habitat is really the best and easiest thing that we can all engage in. Um, and there are conservation efforts um, happening. Monarch Watch and I think the, Zer uh, the Xerces Society, I have a hard time saying that word, uh, and several other organizations are now um, starting the process to see if getting endangered species protection mm -hmm. for the monarch is, is possible. And so they're doing some specialized studies this year. Yep. Um, there are often butterfly counts 
that help support efforts like that. So, Butterfly counts mm -hmm. as in people actually going out and counting? Right. How do they do that? Right, so it's really similar to bird counts. So a lot of people have heard about the Christmas bird count that yes. happens every year. This is a butterfly count that happens in the summer. And so a group, I, I believe the Eugene Springfield chapter of the North American Butterfly Association is the local group that works on that. So there will be a day, volunteers will come together, they will go to an area that's known to have good butterfly habitat and they will you know, spread out in different areas and count what they see. And by doing counts like that from year to year, we can get a pretty good indication of how the population is changing over time. Hmm. So if you plant host plants uh, in, in your yard, mm -hmm. can you just assume that the butterflies will come? Or uh, is it just a matter of luck? It, it's. A little bit of luck in the sense that like an individual host plant or even a small cluster of host plants is going to be a wonderful find for a butterfly that's looking for it. If it's the only plant or cluster of plants you know, in a, a large radius, the butterfly might not actually make their way there to know that that plant is there. So in addition to planting our own backyard habitats, I guess the other thing that we can and, and should do is really encourage our neighbors to plant the butterfly host plants as well. Because the more of those host plants that exist in an area, the more likely the butterflies are to find it. And once they find it, sense. and once they know that it's a regular source, either of nectar or you know the host plant sites, the more likely they are to come back year after year. Yeah, last year I tried planting uh, milkweed seed. Mm. I, I didn't see a single plant growing, so mm. I think I may have just gotten unlucky is do we have to have a certain type of soil what works best yeah they grow pretty well in this area particularly if you have one of the native milkweeds so I mentioned earlier that we we focus on three types um, the two natives that we really promote are incarnata and speciosa and then the third is that we use is Kurosavica, and that's known as a tropical milkweed. So the difference there is that the Incarnata and Speciosa will overwinter really easily and self-propagate, mm -hmm. whereas with the Kurosavica, you need to plant it in the spring in moist soil, and, and, um, and it, it does grow pretty well in this area. And you carry all three? We do, yeah. yes, the plants yeah. and seeds. And, that's, yeah. and do you need to fertilize them, I'm in the soil in any way, any you special know, care? My sense is that someone who has a garden where other flowering plants are thriving, that these they will as well. So that because particularly, you know, because they're native to this area, they don't need a lot of a lot of pampering or amending. When I was growing up, I remember milkweed growing along a fence row mm. uh, behind our house. Mm -hmm. And no one had planted them there. They were mm -hmm. weeds. Mm -hmm. You know, no one thought of them as flowers or plants to put in a garden. Uh, so it, it seemed to me like the, the seeds that I planted last year should have just sprouted up, but mm -hmm. it could be that um, maybe they got too much shade or, or some other problem, I don't mm -hmm. know. But they, they do enjoy full sunlight, so yeah. you, know, you might try just picking a different area next year. Just, you know, I think I might try more. actual plants rather than uh -huh. seeds. Maybe, maybe that would work better mm -hmm. and then I could choose more carefully where I was going to put them too. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. What else? What other things do people need to keep in mind for creating a, a, a total backyard habitat? Mm -hmm. You know, I really think that um, the things that we love as gardeners are things that butterflies love as well. So mm -hmm. variety, a wide variety of color, different flowering plants, different times of the year, flowers at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just more, more is better. <laughs> so we're talking spring, summer, fall because mm -hmm. the, the butterflies leave during the winter months. That's right. Yeah. The monarchs do, yes. So, um, they, and that might be interesting for folks that are watching the show also to just hear a little bit more about that because they're, if you think about the size of the butterfly, I mean, it's, um, its migration pattern is really impressive. So the butterflies from here, like I said, are going to overwinter in Southern California. Butterflies to the east go to Mexico. There's a, there's a range of up to 3,000 miles like where butterflies are seen in the northernmost points and the southernmost points during their migration. I think I've read that the, the longest um, 
the sort of tracked individual butterfly migration was 2,000 miles. That that, that wow. individual butterfly just covered 2,000 miles. It's totally it's amazing. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yes. And they do a lot of things to make that trip a little easier on themselves. They use um, wind currents and the hot water, I mean hot air currents to move them along. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they are working very, very hard. And I'm guessing that the, the ones that in the east that go to Mexico have to cross the, they have to cross the water, don't they? The Gulf of Mexico? Or do they, they stay over land all the way down? You know, that, that would make sense, that at least some of them are. I, I haven't actually seen a map, you know, specifically showing whether, whether they're crossing over the Gulf or, or sticking of to Of course, land. there are islands where they could no. take a pit stop and, and get some more food, mm -hmm. you know, on the way. But mm -hmm. still, that's, mm -hmm. that's rather astonishing yeah. to think of such fragile creatures crossing such huge distances uh, right. just depending on wind and air current, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. heat and so forth to, mm -hmm. to move them along. Mm -hmm. Right. And as we're talking it through, I mean, yes, they would need to, to stay with land because they, they don't fly during the night. So they're flying during the day oh. and they, they would yeah, need a they place, would need to, a place land to land. land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's just totally amazing. One of the other interesting things to me about the migration is that you'll remember me saying that the adult butterfly has a lifespan of about a little over a month under the best conditions. And so um, on the way up, it's actually multiple generations that are making that flight. So the first butterflies that start out are laying eggs along the way and you know those butterflies are emerging and continuing the migration. So wow. it's not the same butterfly that leaves. So we have extended families exactly. migrating together. <laughs> but <laughs> generations migrating, yes, continuing the migration. So on the way up, it's multiple generations. We'll have like three generations over the course of the summer. Mm -hmm. But in the fall, the generation that's going to head south actually develops a little bit differently for the migration and they make the entire trip south themselves. And they overwinter and they become active in the spring and start the migration north again. So most of the generations are living four or five, maybe six weeks at the most. But that fall generation is living for months while it makes the whole migration south, overwinters, and then mates the next spring. You know, I just wanted to point out that uh, we've talked all about how beautiful butterflies are mm. and how much we love seeing them in our garden and we want to save them just because they're so beautiful. But uh, it should also be mentioned that they are pollinators mm -hmm. and uh, are r working right alongside bees and hummingbirds to help pollinate plants that we may be depending upon for food. Right. So uh, are there any other important roles of butterflies or is this uh, one of the, our, our primary motivators for mm -hmm. making sure that they survive? You know, I would say that another important role is that they are an indicator species, similar again to the, to the bees, that, so that when the butterfly population is struggling, it's really a sign for us to look at larger forces. You know, it's an indication of changes happening in the climate or changes happening in land management. Mm -hmm. And so they, they serve that function as well. Yeah, that's really good to know. And great food for thought as well. So, um, you had mentioned earlier about Fort Umpqua. Yes. Um, do you have any other information about that? I mean, of the, course. I, mean, I know it's not exactly on the subject of butterflies, mm. but uh, it's something that people could see at the Education Center. And so That's tell right. us more about that. That's right. And so circling back around to the earlier theme of please come, <laughs> please come and visit. <laughs> uh, talking about the fort is, is another piece of that. And we often find like for families that come, you know, there might be, children that are really interested in the butterflies, maybe one person's really interested in gardens, but it's always nice to have multiple things that people can enjoy because everyone has different interests. So we've got some pictures here, and what we're looking at first is an aerial view of our replica of Fort Umpqua. I mentioned earlier that it was a trading fort, and it was the southernmost fort, trading fort for the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, and so primarily what was happening at Fort Umpqua was uh, trading and trapping. So, um, so it was a source of industry, you know, trappers that were in that area would bring their pelts to Fort Umpqua to, um, to sell them. And then the pelts would be uh, shipped down the river and then up to British Columbia where the Hudson's Bay Company um, is based. And so 
The our replica is um, really pretty amazing to me because it was done with volunteers, and so it's people in the local community who were really interested in the local history and knew that that um, the existence of Fort Umpqua was something that not a lot of people knew about. And so they decided to, to recreate it. And I think I mentioned earlier that most of the wood was donated from uh, local folks that have timber land. Um, most of the labor was all volunteer. And was, so, was the yeah. wood uh, new or um, recovered wood? It was, um, I believe, mostly like folks that needed to thin um, timberland that they had and then donated the logs. Oh, okay. And then the volunteers so the processed the logs okay. using um, the, not exactly the equipment that they would have been using in the 1840s, but more along that style. So it's wow. all like rough hewn uh, lumber and it's a, it's a really great, um, it's a great building. And then Very it's authentic. got, yeah, and, and a few additions to make it, um, you know, accessible and, you know, a little bit more secure in, in case of, uh, you know, earthquakes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we did have to build it to code, but as much as possible in the style that was used at the time. <laughs> Our authentic replica built to code. <laughs> and yeah. Yes, that's well, right. That's good. That's that, how, that's you know, thing. that is how we figure things out, isn't it? Because you want everyone to be able to enter the building. You know, you want and everyone to be, to be able to enjoy Especially in the it. event of an earthquake. Exactly, exactly. And and the original Fort Umpqua, um, what ultimately happened to the original Fort Umpqua was that it burned in a fire. And then even though some of the trading continued for a while after that, um, later a massive flood that we believe uh, washed the, the, the remains of the buildings away. So given that history, we want to make sure that our replica lasts a little bit longer yeah. <laughs> and, no, and is ready, <laughs> ready for what comes. <laughs> <laughs> so if we have just a couple more photos, you'll see um, there are a couple of buildings inside the, the fort compound. And one of them is made up like a storeroom. So you can see the kinds of things that people would have been trading for at the time. We can go on. Uh, we also do like blacksmith demonstrations and things like that. Oh, cool. And during parts of the year, we might have historical reenactment. Um, this is a man named Scott Dana who lives out actually in the McKenzie Highway. And he comes down a few times a summer and, and, uh, and puts himself in the era um, of the, one of the people that helped to create Fort Umpqua. And do you have somebody who makes the clothing for the reenactments? Yeah, we do, we do. We have received grants in the past to get the materials, and then there are a couple of folks, our founder being one of them, and a couple of other women in town that have uh, made all of the costumes. I would guess then that they have to do a lot of research. That's right. And then be a really good seamstress to, to create something for which you don't have a pattern. You just yes. have to put it together. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Wow, yeah. that, that's quite a, a skill. <laughs> yeah. There are also uh, kids' activities that happen at different times the, the, during the year at the fort. And so this last slide I just include because one of the things that I appreciate about the existence of our fort is that it always reminds me of like how hard it would have been to live in that area at that time. So, you know, just Seeing because the fort in the winter is a, a reminder to me of just how how cold oh, and wet it is in this part of the have country. Central heat, exactly. there's mud everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I I get that. I uh, I built my own house. I, I did not. I had people build my own house last year, and uh, I lived with mud, mm. I, uh, mud and cold because I was living in a little cabin that was very leaky and mm -hmm. and so I was cold and muddy all winter long. <laughs> so I think that I probably had an easier time than the folks who were living at Fort Umpqua back in the day, but mm. still, I can, I can sympathize. Yeah. There are uh, historical reenactment groups that um, like to use Fort Umpqua. So they, in the fall, um, there'll be a harvest moon rendezvous where folks come and from, like there's a time uh, Thursday at noon or something like that, where after that time, everything needs to be in period. And so they will come with their, their own costumes and their canvas tents and their blacksmith equipment and other things and basically set up um, a living environment and, and live there for several days oh, kind of cool. in the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> and there is a, a direct, another direct connection between Fort Umpqua and the gardens that we've been talking about because mm -hmm. Fort Umpqua was really the site that introduced agriculture 
cultivated agriculture to the Umpqua Valley. So there is a long history, you know, most of the heritage apple trees that are in that region mm -hmm. originated in one way or another from Fort Umpqua. So the trees were brought in there, there was a garden, there was an orchard, and then, you know, they spread from that area. So it is an important part of um, that piece of Oregon's history. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. How interesting. So, um, do you do you have any more pictures of Fort Umpqua, or I think those are the pictures. That, of that's that's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. then tell us more about visiting the center and any upcoming events that you have. Okay, great. So our main season is between Memorial Day and Labor Day, and so during that time we are open seven days a week. We welcome folks to come down, enjoy what we're doing, and also do their own thing, uh, enjoy the gardens and hang out. We're, we do operate year-round. We're open Tuesday through Friday this time of year, and folks are always welcome to come walk the gardens. Uh, I've got here a list of some of the larger events that we do. Our opening weekend, like I said, is Memorial Day weekend. On June 20th, we have what we call Blooms and Butterflies, which is a celebration of the gardens. And there's also a run that happens. There's a, there are meals. You know, People can come and eat and make a day of it and bring the family. In August, there's the Elkstock Music Festival, which we don't put that on, but we're the host for it. <laughs> and, yes, and it is exactly what you think it is. <laughs> so, several bands. I think last year we, there were 11 or 12 bands that performed, and uh, people can come and camp and enjoy the music, and it's a fundraiser for the music program in the lo local high school. And that's okay with the local community. They don't have any any issues with that. They're all Last for it? year was the first year, and oh. it was great. People enjoyed it. We had a lot of folks come out, and the community is very supportive of the high school. Oh, so that's an good. event that supports the high school is going to be going to be uh, well supported. Oh, so it it was actually kind of a fundraiser for the high school. Yes. Okay. Yeah, for the music program at the high school, mm -hmm. and we hosted it at our location. Over Labor Day weekend, we have Fort Umpqua Days, where there are a lot of activities focused at the fort. We've also got craft vendors. Again, a lot of food. That's a common theme with events at our place. There will always be food. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> exactly. Some of us find that very, very appealing. <laughs> and I, I think I mentioned earlier, we do operate a cafe and, and coffee shop during the summer. The kids in the youth employment program run that. So families can always find a good meal there. And then over Thanksgiving weekend, there's a community-wide uh, open studio event where people can come and watch artists work in their studios. The five wineries in the area are open, and we have a holiday gift sale at ECEC. What did you mean by um, the open studios? What kind of artists do you mm. have? There are a lot of great artists in that area. Um, there are jewelers, painters, um, potters. And uh, there's one woman who does um, pen and ink drawings, and she also volunteers at ECEC. And one day she was staffing, she was volunteering to staff our gift shop. And someone came in and they were looking at a mushroom book and you know, thinking about buying it. And she looked up and saw what they had. She said, oh, I did the drawings for that. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is, a national publication, you know, like one of the mm -hmm. you know, best books about mushrooms. And the woman who did all of the illustrations the is standing right there. Exactly, lives in Elton. <laughs> That's um, cool. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's a small community in a beautiful area. And if what you do is, you know, you live by your craft, like mm -hmm. what, uh, um, what better life than to find a beautiful, quiet space to uh, to do your art and to be able to make a living uh, at your craft? What, that's uh, mm. what a blessing. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and we specialize. One of the things we specialize in in our gift shop is being an outlet for that. So we do have local craftspeople who will sell what they make at our gift shop, in addition to a lot of butterfly themed items and uh, things that help help people plant their own gardens. Oh, that's, I, I'm, I'm so anxious now to go visit. I never knew that this place existed, but oh. uh, now I, there are so many reasons to go. It just sounds really wonderful. Oh, that's great. That's great. And we can close I, up with just a series of photos of events. I don't even need to talk about them, but just the last pictures are events okay. on site. But go ahead. Well, we're, we're running out of time now, so mm. uh, let's just run through the, the photos really fast. We have concerts, we have workshops, people come and do art classes in the gardens, and really, we just welcome everyone to come visit. Okay. 
Um, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for people who talk about manure with a straight face. Join us next week as we continue our backyard adventures. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.